A warm welcome and greetings to all participants joining this ILC Asia webinar series on COVID-19, the first of which will be focusing on the theme of food system resilience from global and Asian perspectives. Today is part one of two on this topic with eminent experts as speakers. My name is Bun Yi, the Executive Director of ILC Southeast Asia Region based in Singapore who is the host of this webinar. Join me and on behalf of my collaborating colleagues from other UC Asia entities, we would like to thank our guests on today's speakers panel who take valuable times to join us from their PC schedule. I'd like to take just a few minutes to provide some housekeeping messages. First, that all participants are muted by the platform. This webinar is conducted in English and if you have questions for the speaker, please use the chat box. Selected questions will be discussed during the panel discussion. We will record this webinar and will be posted in the UC website already. You may or may not be familiar with ILC. I'm happy to take a few minutes to introduce the organization, what we do, and why we bring experts together to share and discuss this important subject like today's. UC is a global federation of non-profit scientific organization. And our mission is to provide science that improves human health and well-being and safeguards the environment. Initiated in 1987, UC has over the 40 years grown to a network of 15 entities across the world, six of which are in Asia, comprising of UC Japan, Korea, India, Taiwan, a focal point in China, and in Southeast Asia region, which covers the grouping of ASEAN and Australasia. UC fosters tripartite collaboration and provide platform to facilitate multi-stakeholders uh, engagement, such as from academia, government, and industries to advance science in the area of nutrition and health, food safety and risk assessment, and in sustainability, sustainable food system and the environment. We aim to achieve positive real-world impact in target areas, such as those identified in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Through our extensive international scientific network, UC examines and resolves questions of science for sound decision-making. We encourage the development of quality data, seek evidence to evaluate food in relation to health and diseases, improve risk assessment methods, and provide insight on new technologies harness for health, and of course, in supporting community-based program that improves lives, and many more. For example, in 2019, we hosted over 150 scientific meetings and workshops worldwide, and some of these are shared as education videos posted to our website with over 70 scientific publication and research efforts made through our global tripartite collaboration um, across many sectors. The success and output of UC is based on our principle of multi-sector multi collaboration or core mission of science for public health benefits with pool funding and expertise where activities are conducted through transparent and adoption of scientific processes, integrity processes. We do not lobby, but advocate for good science for the basis of decision-making. UC's governing board has a minimum of 50% public sector representation. UC Asian entities have long history of collaboration and joint activities, some of which are shown here, that are conducted in 2019 and with several ongoing projects and publications. This brings me to the series of webinars, which is part of UC's global initiatives. Several already has been held earlier this year. Example, two global webinars on nutrition and immunities in April and May, and several held in Latin America and, and the US since March. So without further ado, I'd like to bring on our panel of speakers. They're all well-recognized and international and regional experts who have extensive and in-depth knowledge on food system, 
food security and sustainability, with many years of experience working in the agri-food and finance sectors. Professor Shengen Fang from the China Agricultural University, Professor Paul Tang from National Institute of Education International, Nanyang Technology University, and Mr. Ping Chiu from Rubber Bank Asia Pacific. I will introduce each at the start of their presentation. I'll be brief as their distinguished career and accomplishment are in the bio data that you can download. First, let me welcome Professor Shengen Fan, who is Chair Professor with the China Agricultural University, who recently stepped down as Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, in the US, after serving the leadership role there for 10 over years. Dr. Fan is globally known for his extensive work in helping developing countries in culture and food policy. He was the vice chair and chair of the World Economic Forum Global Council on Food and Nutrition Security and has received numerous awards for his achievements. Professor Fan, the next 20 minutes is yours. Welcome. Very good, very good. Okay, so thanks for the opportunity uh, for uh, this morning that I can present some of my sort of thoughts on COVID-19 and global food and nutrition security. So I think it, this is such a great uh, risk to everybody that we have seen, we have not seen for decades. So it's everybody's job, it's everybody's, um, it's a duty or responsibility to work together. So what, I, what I'm going to do is to highlight uh, some of the, let's say, facts on how global food and nutrition security has been affected by COVID-19, and particularly supply chain. So how supply chains have been interrupted. And finally, I wanted to speak a couple of points with regard to future food system, because right now the COVID-19 is a wake up call for everybody. What sort of food system uh, we would like to have uh, in the future to make sure that uh, we will continue to have healthy and nutritious and sustainable foods and diets for everybody. Okay, so I have already mentioned that, so I'm going to speak about the current global food and nutrition security, so it is already under threat. The second is supply chains that have been interrupted because of COVID-19. And I also wanted to point out how have governments, international organizations, and even the private sector responded to COVID-19? So we can draw the lessons, we can share the experience with each other to make sure that under COVID-19, um, everybody has access to nutritious and healthy foods. Now, again, as I mentioned, future food supply chains and future food system really needed to rethought. So how can we make sure that um, we can continue to innovate, continue to uh, introduce institutional changes to make sure that our global food system will work for everybody. Now, right now, even before the uh, COVID-19, we already have 820 million people who suffer from hunger. And even more important, 2 billion people suffer from so-called hidden hunger, lack of micronutrients like vitamin A, zinc, and iron. And this hidden hunger is as damaging as visible hunger. And again, we have more than 2 billion people who suffer from overweight and obesity. Our children are stunted. So the latest report from UNICEF, WHO, shows that right now we have 145 million children who are stunted. So all together, all together, we lose probably 5 to 10% of GDP globally because of these different forms of malnutrition. So it is, um, that's a nutrition problem, it is a health problem, it is also economic problem. Now, because of COVID-19, we will see dramatically increased poverty and hunger. So IPRI, where I worked as Director General for 10 years, shows that for every percent, every 1% economic growth reduction, that there will be probably about 14 million more poor people. You know, based on $1, $1.90 per day poverty now. So could you imagine if we have 6% economic growth reduction? Uh, so the, for 2020, IMF projected that 
the global economic growth will be negative 3% compared to 3% positive 3% growth without COVID-19. So you can see 6% net reduction in economic growth, which really means that we will see probably 80 to 90 million poor people in the world. And again, the, the global report for food crisis reported that in 2019, we had about 135 million people who suffer from extreme hunger, or called acute hunger, much worse than chronic hunger. And COVID-19 will add another, another 130 million extreme hungry people in the world. So together in 2020, we will see probably around 265 million extreme hungry people. And because of the um, slow growth, economic growth, many people will not be able to access to nutritious and healthy foods. So they will just buy some stable foods like rice, wheat, and maize, which means that they will suffer uh, from lack of balanced, diverse diets. This will have long-term impact on the children, uh, on, on the youth, and even elderly people. Now, obviously, COVID-19 caused major disruptions in food supply. But the impact, impact is heterogeneous. We can see that uh, it is very different from a 2007, 2008 a food, food price price. I was working at April that time, and then we really zoomed in to look at the causes, consequences, and the policy actions we can take to, to avoid the global food price crisis. So that time, is, it was a higher food price crisis. But this time, it's different. The consumers, because of lack of uh, purchasing power, consumers demand less healthy, nutritious foods. So prices of the fruits and the vegetables are actually quite low. On the other hand, smallholders cannot sell vegetables, fruits, and then many other nutritious, healthy uh, food products. So you can see food prices are low for consumers as well as for producers for different reasons. And if you look at the whole supply chain, food supply chain, so it is smallholders, it is small traders, it is poor consumers who suffer much more than anybody else. And here I wanted to emphasize the smallholders, youth, women, and the rural migrants, refugees, that do not have the capacity to deal with the crisis. They also lack of capacity to recover from the shocks. Here, the trade has also been affected. I will talk a bit more about how countries have used the trade uh, as a way to secure their own domestic food supply. Now, clearly, public programs, such as school feeding programs, social protection programs, public kitchens, food banks, uh, have been disrupted in many countries. And we have seen a tremendous increase of demand of food from food banks, food banks from 50 to 100 percent in different parts of the world. Now, how have countries responded to COVID-19? So we can really draw the lessons and share the experiences to tackle the challenges we all face together. The food industry Asia presented a very good uh, chart. I call it traffic lights. They monitor the situation in Asia weekly, so every week. If you look at this chart, you will see three different colors, green, orange, and red. Green means great, not much affected. Orange, it's in the middle. Red, it is severely affected by the COVID-19. So the first chart sh shows you the status of recovery. So many countries already begin to recover from COVID-19. And you will see that many countries are, are in green, except Sri Lanka, import and export, are still being affected by COVID-19. Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand, import and export. So the port facilities have been, have been affected because of labor shortage, because of the quarantine policies uh, and, uh, and beyond. Now, let me move to the Okay, the, the countries 
that still have restrictions, including Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, many Southeast Asian countries uh, are in. And yes, again, many countries have red dots, or sorry, uh, green dots, except that's the Philippines. The many food manufacturing has been affected. And in Singapore, I think the food services, just before this webinar, I heard that uh, uh, the people in Singapore are still struggling uh, with food services because restaurants, many food services are still in lockdown mode. Now, um, I came to China in January, so after 35 years of abroad, and immediately uh, I have been working with uh, researchers uh, to provide data, provide uh, support, advice to the government. So the, the government took the food issue very seriously, partly because of the, uh, uh, well, the food security has always been the top priority. And part of me, the researchers have really worked with the government to make sure that food and nutrition security are as important as health. So, as you know, the uh, Wuhan uh, was locked down on January 23rd, just before the Chinese New Year. So the first big effort from the Chinese government is from the Ministry of Agriculture, Transportation, and Public Security, and so on. So they joined and issued a notice or, or urgent call to make sure that different departments have to coordinate with each other to ensure uh, effective logistics for food supply and the materials. And from the top of the government, the State Council uh, Premier Li Keqiang on February 5, uh, called uh, a meeting to make sure that um, there is a green channel. The green channel word was used first time to make sure that uh, fresh agriculture products, the input for producing food uh, have to be secured. So nobody can use these unauthorized roadblocks to block uh, food supply and the inputs for food production. And the, the private sector has also been very active, obviously, again, supported by the government to use the e-delivery platforms to link smallholders you know, from villages to urban communities without uh, middle, it's a, uh, middle handlers. So that's really uh, not just a it's a technological innovation, as, as I can see, it is also institutional innovation, the point point delivery of food from producing communities to, consume, to consuming communities. Then obviously, uh, the poultry industry was very much affected because uh, the poultry industry couldn't get feed, couldn't get labor, couldn't sell their products. So probably 50, even 70% of the, the poultry industry firms uh, were facing tremendous challenges. Uh, the, uh, in fact, the whole supply was very much affected. Uh, so to solve that problem, the uh, National Development and the Reform Com Commission and the Minister of Agriculture, Rural Affairs, and many other departments to make sure that uh, there is a special policy, there was a special policy to support uh, the poultry industry by providing, again, the green channels, but also financial support, financial support to uh, make sure that the small and medium-sized uh, poultry industry and then that, that only expanded it to other, uh, to other uh, business sectors, uh, for example, the uh, vegetables, fruits, uh, pork, and, and beyond. So that really helped uh, to make sure that the, uh, the, the whole food system remains functioning. Now, how other countries have responded? So um, although I left IPRI, I still work with IPRI very closely. IPRI set up a monetary system to make uh, to monitor the prices, the food and supply chains in different countries. And equally important is to monitor the policy responses in developing countries. There are several points I just wanted to mention. One is the major restrictions on urban food traders. Now, in many developing countries, Africa, South Asia, the small informal traders play a huge or critical role in linking uh, producers to consumers, but they have been affected by knockdowns, by restrictions. And yes, some positive news. So there, there was a widespread support for contactless payments. So now you don't need to use cash. You, know, you, can, you can just use e-payment to pay your transactions. We have seen increased support from the government, like Nigeria, uh, well, obviously India, and then targeted support to consumer livelihoods, and lots of social protection systems, 
uh, that has been launched and resumed to protect urban consumers. But we also see there's less support for agriculture than for other forms of economic assistance. So this is something I wanted to emphasize. So agriculture, smallholder farmers deserve much better support. And obviously ministries of agriculture have been excluded from many national response, uh, response let's say strategies, dialogue, or high level engagement. Now I want to talk a bit more about export bans. Starting March, April, many countries, including some of our neighbors, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, were planning or already beginning to impose some of the export bans, particularly in the case of rice. But global communities and regional communities have worked so hard to create a pressure for these countries not to use export bans. The wheat exporters, including Russia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, were also planning to uh, to impose wheat export bans. But because of global pressure, uh, uh, pressure, the G20, the G20 country issued a statement. I really like, I really appreciate that statement. First time, you know, the ministers of agriculture, agriculture met physically, uh, sorry, virtually, without face-to-face -face meeting. But they issued a joint statement to make sure that the global food supply chain remain open. In particular, export bans should not be used. Now, the global institutions, as I mentioned, G20, the United Nations, FAO, WFP, EFAT, um, and WHO, WTO, have all worked together day by day, evening by evening, to monitor, to track uh, the food supply, food demand, prices, and markets, and to ensure smooth function of supply chains. And the African Union, and also Matt and Learning, may to better coordinate their efforts at the regional level. So here, uh, uh, I, I do think this time, uh, the global institutions have worked, have worked together uh, very effectively, efficiently. Obviously more needs to be done, particularly in terms of providing financial support for Africans, for South Asians to, uh, to cope with these shocks and to recover from this shock. Now, so what, what does that mean to our future su supply chains or our global food system? Before the COVID-19, uh, the, the global, global community and the national policymakers have already thought about our future food system. You know, the Sustainable Development Goals were launched in September 2015. I think among 15, 17 goals, at least half of the goals are very much related to uh, food supply chains, very much related to food systems. So food system must be, must producing healthy, nutritious foods, must be sustainable, must be climate resilient. But after COVID-19, two characteristics have become very prominent. The one is inclusion, the other one is resilience. So why inclusion? I think inclusion is so important to make sure that everybody in the food system, smallholders, women, youth, refugees, the population in conflict areas must engage, must empower, must benefit from the global food system. By doing that, we can reduce poverty. So without inclusive food system, it will not be able to achieve the poverty reduction goal by, 20, by 2030. Then we know that poverty, hunger, malnutrition usually carry over generation by generation. To break that cycle, we must make sure that our food system supply chains must be inclusive and reduce global and national inequalities. Inequality in the food system and supply chain is a major factor of the global and national inequalities. And if we make sure that our food system is inclusive, we can also accelerate economic growth, economic recovery uh, from uh, COVID-19. Now, smallholders are hit very hard, and they are very critical in the whole supply chain and the whole food system. They do not have access to credit, do not have access to training, to land, or markets. So we must continue to work on that. And a couple of recommendations. One is obviously very clear, to ensure availability of agriculture inputs to farmers, whether through 
uh, credit support, whether it's through specific governments, not subsidies. I think here I want to emphasize it's not just the subsidies. It's more providing, let's say, um, support through the credit, through insurance, uh, through the land tenure system, uh, through inclusive agribusiness models, and facilitate a better risk management for smallholders. Now, the resilience. Yes, this is, this is uh, it's not just a buzzword. I know everybody, even including our webinar, we use the resilience as, as a keyword. So resilience is not a buzzword. It has real meaning. It means that individuals, communities, or even national governments have the capability, have the capacity to deal with the shocks, to recover from shocks, or even do better after shocks. And obviously, resilience can address conflict. This is still an, an issue in Middle East, uh, in some African countries, even here in Afghanistan. And then investing in agriculture research. So here I want to emphasize it's not just a yield enhancement. The agriculture research, the new technology, new technologies must bring multiple wins. Wins in yields, yes. Wins in stability. Wins against the climate change. Uh, wins on nutrition. The resilience will be very part of this. So newer varieties should be able to stand against shocks, weather shocks, um, whether it's droughts, whether it's heat waves, or even, even floods. Now, social protection. Here, social protection is not just a, a handover. It's not just a waste of money. If the social protection is well designed, it can actually help to recover from the COVID-19. And it can really uh, set a new track for the society to prosper. And the trade restrictions, I wanted to emphasize uh, trade here. The trade must be transparent. I think our uh, regional director mentioned about it, transparency. So the trade must be transparent, must be fair, must benefit uh, poor and hungry people. And finally, I wanted to mention the empowering women. Women plays a critical role uh, in is addressing shocks uh, from COVID-19. And they also play a very critical role in linking uh, smallholders, farmers to final, final consumers, and linking agriculture production to health and nutrition. So finally, I wanted to present a short-term and long-term perspective of our food supply chains or food system. The one is green channels. Green channels must be established. I know that in many countries, uh, the food supply chain is still severely uh, disrupted. We must make sure that just like any health products, foods are as important as health products. The smallholders, small traders, and the SMEs need special support. And new technologies such as e-commerce platform uh, should be encouraged. That can also um, help to avoid uh, the individual person-to-person -person contacts. And protecting smallholders, small, uh, poor consumers, particularly women, children, elderly, uh, make sure that they have access to nutritious and healthy diets, and trade must be open. And then let's all think together, how can we really uh, pursue a more inclusive, resilient food supply chains and a food system? Let me thank you this, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Fan. That's an excellent that's an excellent presentation, Professor Fan. And um, if you wanted to know more of the work of Professor Fan, please look into his excellent uh, list of publication as well as uh, from the biodata that we show. Um, the question and answers will be uh, in the uh, in the panel discussion. Next, I would like to put, uh, introduce Professor Paul Tang, who many of you already know, and uh, he is uh, well known in the international expertise in food security as well as in sustainable development. Professor Tang has over 30 years of experience working in various sectors, in uh, both public and private, and uh, he has published over about uh, 250 technical papers and his latest book is on issue and food security in 
published in 2018. Professor Tang, the floor is yours. I'd like to build on the excellent presentation of Dr. Fan and focus on an important sub-region within Asia, which is Southeast Asia. I'm sorry, I'm having some problems here with moving my slides. Can the LC host please move my slides? Uh, next slide, please. Now, the region I want to talk about is Southeast Asia, and it can be represented by ASEAN. And for our friends from outside this region, ASEAN stands for the, uh, it's the uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is a very diverse group of 10 countries. I thought it's important to give some background first before I discuss impact of COVID-19 and also in general the, the impact of disruptors on ASEAN food systems and food system resilience. Now within ASEAN, our 10 countries, we have countries that range from very high per capita incomes to low per capita incomes. But what we do know is that there's about 350 million middle class, which is approximately half the population here in the ASEAN region. And we also know that the sustainability of supply chains and the resilience in the food systems is dependent in this region on many factors, uh, arable land for self-production, GDP per capita, capacity for trade, natural resources, infrastructure investments, and so on. Next slide, please. One of the, uh, the foundations, obviously, for resiliency you know, is, is the ability to have capacity for production. Arable land, in Southeast Asia, it's only about 16% of our total land area. And if we look at it in terms of per capita, it's only about 0.12 hectares per capita. Okay? And, and there's a, a variance amongst ASEAN countries. If you look at just agricultural land on this table here, it varies from Singapore, which is the lowest, less than 1%, to Thailand, which is about 43% of, of its land, total land area in agriculture. But in terms of arable land, uh, then, you know, the figures become a bit lower. Thailand has the most arable land percent, about 33% roughly. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. But what is important to note is that, uh, as uh, was previously noted, the ASEAN region is becoming more and more urban. Okay. And if you look at the table, the extreme column on the right-hand side, you know, we have countries like Singapore, which is almost 100% urban, to Cambodia, that's about 23% urban. But recognizing that, we also see that employment in agriculture okay, has been declining in this region. In fact, quite spectacularly in some countries. So today we've got Singapore, which is less than 0.1% of its population engaged uh, gainfully in agriculture for employment. To Cambodia, the latest figures from the ADB give about 64.3%. But the big but is that agriculture's contribution to national development, the GDP in particular, has been declining and still continues to decline. Okay. So if we look at the figures again for 2018 from the ADB, they range from Singapore, which is less than 0.01%, so it's recorded as zero here, to Cambodia, which is about 23.5%. Okay. So, so these are important foundational uh, uh, kind of data to help us understand how we move forward in Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, despite our limitations in the ASEAN region, as a region, we actually do quite well. Now, ASEAN is the source of many agri-food products. And this table here quickly shows, you know, that the products for which the ASEAN countries individually rank amongst the top three in the world in exports. Rice, obviously, Thailand and Vietnam are very well known. Vegetable oil, Coconuts, sugar, pineapple, coffee, legumes, cassava. These are some of the important agri-commodities 
of which the region is well positioned to supply the rest of the world. And, and I make this point because obviously when we talk about supply chains, we don't just receive products from outside the region, we also send products from outside the region. Now, along those lines, ASEAN is also based for an increasing number of agri-food commodity traders with over a billion US dollars in sales per year. And this includes the likes of uh, Wilma, CP Group, Sam W, Olam, and so on, really. And, and the list is growing uh, in terms of the number of players that are becoming important uh, commodity traders. And these are quite several from the big fives globally, like Cargill and so on. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, we do know that food security in ASEAN you know, is sustained because of the many supply chains that we have. Some of them are interlocking. I think Prof. Fan mentioned inputs, and certainly in the area of inputs, you know, for the supply chains, they really interlock. It could be the same supply chains supplying different uh, food supply chains. And the origin of the supply chains also is from both within and outside ASEAN. And next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. The, the supply chains are important because they are an important component of sustaining food security and also to provide resilience for the region, okay, for countries and for the ASEAN region. I wanted to share this, uh, this diagram here from the Economist Intelligence Unit's Global Food Security Index of 2019. And, and uh, I know there are some counter arguments about shortening supply chains, but this is just to show that you know, the data that they have, the food security is not affected by dependency on food imports under normal circumstances. And that's very important to recognize. And we know that COVID-19 is not a normal situation. Uh, I'll delve a bit more on this uh, later on. Next, please. Okay. So supply chains also reflect the production from food systems. Okay. And in ASEAN, you know, rice is still a main feature of many of our food systems at the national level in ASEAN. And this figure, you know, just, just in a summary, just shows that. Okay. And the picture has not changed for many decades in, in the ASEAN region. So ASEAN food system resilience then really depends importantly on extra ASEAN sources. In other words, on food coming in from supply chains that originate from outside the ASEAN region. Okay. And, and the data shows us that all ASEAN states import agri-food products from outside the region. Uh, in particular, wheat, soybean, and corn. So Indonesia, for example, is the world's largest importer of wheat from the latest data that we've seen. And also ASEAN has more agri-food trade with outside the region than within the region. It's estimated that intra-ASEAN food trade is only about 25% of all the exports. Yeah, And we do have a few countries in ASEAN which are, uh, I would say, trade surplus or food surplus in the name of Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Myanmar. Now, next, please. Okay. I, I want to go back to food security and, and refer us back to this Global Food Security Index, GFSI, which I think is, is well known to the many people. Okay. And if you look at this, the data here, you know, in terms of food security, ASEAN really doesn't do too badly. Okay. If you look at the scores and, and the ranking. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Now, Singapore has been ranked amongst the top in food security by the GFSI mainly because of our high scores of availability, affordability, quality, and safety. And it's a country that imports 90% of its food. Okay? But we also know that Singapore has highest affordability in terms of GDP per capita in the ASEAN region. Okay? But back to the GFSI, because this, this particular category again is, is quite enlightening, you know, which shows that food security generally improves as GDP per capita increases. Okay? In other words, the capacity to make food available and to afford food are really proven quite strongly here in terms of GDP per capita, which in the end is reflected in household income itself. Next slide, please. But we know that in exceptional circumstances, like currently, food security and food systems can be disrupted. And this simple figure here shows the four you know, commonly accepted dimensions of food security availability, the fiscal access, to the affordability, economic access, to food utilization. On the left-hand uh, box, there are shown pandemics. 
even though currently we're dealing with pandemics, you know, the, the region itself has many other disruptors. I mean, severe weather is a classical example. This region has one of the highest frequencies of unexpected severe weather. So often when we talk about food systems and resilience, we must keep in mind that the current situation focuses on COVID-19, but we mustn't forget about all the other disruptors that are kind of hovering in the background. Okay. So generally, again, as the EIA GFSI data shows, ASEAN countries are not that resilient to disruptions, especially disruptions in the natural resource base or the climate change. And Singapore is a good example. Okay. It's absolutely not resilient at all in terms of our natural resource base or climate change. Next slide, please. Now, I want to kind of talk about the region a little bit more. There is a lot of regional uh, collaboration and, and, and uh, cooperation to try and build a, a regional approach to issues. Okay? And I highlight here the ASEAN Vision 2025, which is premised on three particular programs, the, the uh, AEC, or ASEAN Economic Community, the ASCC, and then the APSC. In particular, the AEC and the ASCC have embedded in this large initiatives, also some initiatives like on food security, on food agriculture and, and, and the forestry and so on. Next slide, please. Next, please. COVID-19, as has been mentioned, has really been a wake up call for all of us in ASEAN. Okay? And, and this comes at the midpoint of two very important ASEAN level initiatives. These are two of many. I just wanted to highlight these two. The first is the strategic plan, the vision strategic plan of ASEAN cooperation on food, agriculture, and forestry, uh, the SPFAF. Okay, and then the second, of course, is the strategic plan of action for food security, the SPAFS. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Just to show very quickly, you know, in terms of the SPFAF, you know, there are different strategic trusts which all the ASEAN member states have come together to try and focus on. Okay? And I just wanted to highlight the, the, the trust one and trust four, okay, which are particularly germane to our discussions this morning. The others are as well, but more has been accomplished in the others in terms of trade facilitation and so on. If you look at the first one, this is on sustainable production and green technologies. No, we, we really haven't made that much progress in the ASEAN region and a lot more needs to be done. The second is the resilience to climate change, natural disasters and other shocks. Again, we, a lot more progress can be made with a lot more cooperation. So this is one of the two initiatives. This is the SPFAF. Uh, next one, please. So the SPFAF, sorry. Next one, please. Uh, this is on food security, the strategic plan of national security. And here again, you know, there are nine particular uh, trust or initiatives. And I just wanted to highlight those in red here, you know, which are more, more important in the context of COVID-19 and disruptions. Uh, sustainable production, greater investments, which Prof. Fund has also mentioned, emerging issues. Now, let me move on to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. So, Stemming from this kind of prelim assessment of how we're doing with those two big initiatives, uh, here are some opportunities that I would suggest for us going forward in the ASEAN region. It is key to really improve nutrition security in ASEAN. I know Dr. Fan mentioned this in his, uh, in his presentation, and I want to, to, to support that, totally endorse that. If we look at you know the figures that have been published by FAO and others, roughly one out of 10 people in Southeast Asia is still undernourished. Okay? And we do know that undernourishment is strongly linked to household expenditure on food. And this, this figure here really shows that as GDP per capita increases, the percentage of expenditure on food okay, also is reduced as GDP per capita is increased. And what the link is that, you know, as, as people spend more money of their household income on food, the undernourishment or malnutrition is also higher in those families, in those households. So it's imperative in ASEAN that we focus in the next few years on improving nutrition security. Because we're urbanizing, we're having increasing middle class, and yet we have this high level of undernourishment in the ASEAN region. Next slide, please. Now, Dr. Fan also mentioned 
investment, and I totally want to support that. We have to significantly increase the level of investment. But investment in what? Okay. In fact, in the slides that I couldn't move, I modified this last slide to show areas for investment. This includes areas like sustainable production, emergent issues like uh, uh, pandemics, for example, uh, are two just examples. And then other novel food production techniques, new farming systems, these are all areas that in the next few years, we really could do a lot more in the ASEAN region. Okay? And not just because to, to offset the import from outside the region, but also because we also want to have a higher level of self-production to shorten our food supply chains in the ASEAN region. And then also lastly, to the increase the amount of production that we have uh, to supply the rest of the world. Uh, next slide, please. I think let, let me let me conclude uh, these 20 minutes by saying that, you know, for us to sustain uh, ASEAN food supply and also to improve our, our food system resilience in this region, you know, we can best do it through regional initiatives. Okay, but regional initiatives that are built on the strengths of individual ASEAN member states. Okay, we don't have enough time in this webinar to talk about the strengths of individual member states, but there are many. Okay? And the challenge to us in this region, which is also the opportunity, is to work much closer together, to find those common points to work together so that collectively we improve our, our system resilience within the ASEAN region. So thank you very much uh, for listening and we look forward to the panel discussion later. That ends my discussion. Thank you, Buni. Thank you, Professor Teng. Um, that is a very insightful look into the ASEAN situation in comparison to uh, the other part of the world. And um, of course, uh, resilience um, in in terms of securities in a black swan event like COVID is, uh, of course, uh, something that uh, nobody expected. But um, I think this could be really good topics to talk about during the panel. I would like to call upon Mr. Ping Chu now as our next speakers. And Ping is from the Rubber Bank, and he is Head of Food and Agricultural Research and Advisory in Asia, and has many years of experience in research and analysis. And of course, uh, Rubber Bank is well known for its um, link to the food and agricultural sectors. And uh, they are able to provide a lot of the insight in terms of the investment and the finance, as well as how the food and agricultural sector will move and need to move in the coming years. So, Pete. Thank you, Bernie. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the audience here. First, I'd like to thank LC uh, for this opportunity for Rubberbank uh, in this webinar. Uh, and I'm very humbled in front of the two esteemed scientists speakers before me. Uh, I help look after research in food and agri for a bank. And what I'll share um, today is what we gain from our understanding from our clients and the private industries. Now I will elaborate on a few things. One is about the economic and social impact uh, of COVID-19, uh, especially on Asia food and uh, agri supply chain. And I will even briefly mention what the post-COVID environment could look like across Asia. Uh, but I also want to just highlight some longer term issues that the Puru professors have highlighted. Can you turn to the next slide, please? Thank you. Now, uh, for those unfamiliar, Rubble Bank is a Dutch bank. Uh, we have our roots in the Farmers Cooperative. Uh, and as you know, the Netherlands is a, um, a small country, but has a lot of agriculture uh, background. Um, and so that's where Rubble Bank uh, stands from. The Robert Bank is committed to the food and agri sector. Uh, we are a cooperative bank with the purpose of growing a better world together. As a leading food and agri bank and a thought leader on key sustainable food production trends, Robert Bank is taking the lead in many conversations about how the entire food chain is part of the solution to feed the world sustainably. We have been also active on the climate change and sustainability 
discussion, and we believe that partnership is the only way to advance the food security and food sustainability uh, agenda. Um, I will, that's why we collaborated with Tomase uh, and PwC on a report last year, last November, which I'll come back to it at the end of uh, this presentation. So now getting back to COVID-19. Next slide, please. Nasir Talib, who coined the term black swan, has actually came up with and said that this uh, COVID-19, he won't classify as a black swan event. By definition, black swan event by him is an unpredictable, rare, and uh, catastrophic event. And one is, of his main reason is that this is not a black swan because it has been predicted by a few people, including Bill Gates. Nonetheless, the pandemic and its global impact are rare and catastrophic. Such devastation, uh, devastation to demand processing, logistics, supply chains can only come about in severe scenarios of prolonged disasters. And at such global level, only war comes to matching this type of uh, impact bar the destruction of capital stock. Now, COVID-19 has impacted all aspects of our lives, uh, human lives, social changes, business operations, economic activities, uh, global supply chain disruptions. And that should be the context that the FNA sector is facing, which actually, by the way, is not the worst hit in this group. Um, and the virus, while the virus continues to ravage the world, uh, I think the baseline scenario for scientific experts is predicting the uh, the outbreak subside even after summer and you know uh, next year when vaccines are might be very available. So the economic and social impact of the virus will thus be substantial and long lasting. Let me first attempt to highlight these as their impact on the FA industry. They are short and they are medium and term, long term impact. I will only very briefly mention the short term impact because these are already very apparent to everyone here. But the medium and long-term impact are not easily deduced, even as the virus is still doing its damage. In the short term, fundamental decline in demand and disruptions in supply chain linkages have come about because of sickness and health, or sickness and death, lockdowns and movement restrictions. There are actually enough food right now in the world, but they are not getting to all the right places and in the right form. And this has come about because of uh, blockages and in, in ports, trucks, shipping, uh, the farmers' inability to bring produce to market, the plants not getting raw materials and inputs or processing facilities shut down, price for volatilities disrupting stocking level, channel shifting even from food service to food retail. And all these have exposed uh, the vulnerabilities at risk. And as we, as many different regions come to planting reason, uh, season, there's a short-term impact that could get that could uh, affect the future. And this comes from farmers. How do you plan what to farm or what to rear now? Because of the imbalances in the demand supply, the lack of storage, the processing bottlenecks, and especially uncertain demand. And all these are putting a lot of enormous risks on the farmers, especially in small owners. But that is because of how essentially the industry and the world has evolved. Industries, including food and agri, have been built on cost efficiency basis. And sudden low probability, high impact events are not catered for. To build that means diversification, stocking, in redundancy, which will drive costs upwards and margins lower. The key question is if, if we are to build re resiliencies, who's paying the cost? Who's going to put more? Now, this COVID outbreak nevertheless have made clear to all that we take the smooth flow of goods for granted. And the industry and consumers and farmers need to understand where the goods come from, where they are going, where there are key demand risks, where there are key sourcing risks. The virus outbreak have uh, companies also re-examining their whole supply chain. However, to change it against well-established long-standing practices will be challenging. Uh, next slide, please. 
The World Bank's economic outlook is a deep recession this year. And one thing to note is that this is a synchronized global recession. In the past, when we have financial, uh, financial crisis, we have different type of um, recessions, there will be, there could be, and there will be some part of the world that is, that can still uh, engine along and pull the rest up. But in this case, everyone is going through this downturn. And that means no one can help pull it out. Uh, help pull the world up. And that actually is one of the biggest uh, uh, risks surrounding the world uh, economy. In the post, and I'll just now highlight the medium and longer term uh, post-COVID, what we call the new normal world. Many things we think will change, including the f &A sector. The first thing is the road to full recovery will be long from this deep recession. We don't know how the recovery will pan out, really. There has been an alphabet soup of recovery being touted there from B to U to W to L to even long bathtub uh, scenarios. The question is the second wave. The question is um, can, will there be a vaccine? The uh, question is government support program. All these are going to play a part in how the recovery will shape up. But the virus and recovery will also witness many structural changes. And I'll highlight some, uh, some of these. Can you make, turn to the next slide, please? And some of these will impact the f and sector as well. I've mentioned about the synchronized and long, uh, uh, deep recession and the road recovery. Usually, recession takes, especially a, lot, a deeper recession, takes one to two years. How long will this take? Nobody's too sure. And this is a world now with higher debt levels amongst both consumers as well as countries and companies. What we're going to see is high job losses, lower income level. Um, and we will also see that consumer behaviors, in the, uh, uh, social behaviors will change. There'll be more working from home, there'll be less travel, uh, there'll be cautiousness and anxiety from people. Um, nations are beginning to show some tendencies. Uh, one, I think, key victim of this is that there might be a stall in globalization or a reversal in globalization. There's nationalism uh, being witnessed. Um, and even in, throughout the industry, uh, many, especially in across the Asia, are prop, uh, driven by SME industry. Many of these industry uh, uh, fundamentals landscape will change after this. They will take time to recover. The Economist has highlighted. The Economist magazine has highlighted in one of its issue a 90% economy, which will be created after this post COVID. It will be smaller, but there will be also residual fear pervasive uncertainty and the lack of innovative fervor and deepened inequalities. For all these I quote from The Economist. And many changes will come because of personal choice. Now one can easily imagine having experience from working from home after extended time, after the outbreak, people can get used to the idea of working from home and travel less. And that alone will have impact on food service, retail, hospitality. But I'm not sure innovation will be curtailed. As an example, SARS in 2003 is one of the driver that helped accelerate the growth of e-commerce and Alibaba's Taobao, for example, in China, in the behemoth it is now. Next slide. Now, we don't even know, haven't seen the light at the end of the tunnel of this pandemic. And so please bear that in mind when we were trying to make our predictions uh, for post-COVID-4. Asia food and agri sector is a long way from the more efficient ones found in the US or Europe. But we think that this pandemic will actually speed up its modernization. Uh, and some of the possible changes that we've been talking about and highlighting uh, over the years could very well be accelerated. The, one, the first one is digitization. And this is across the whole uh, value chain. 
to obtain more consumer insights, to link and trace uh, supply chain, to connect production to stock or production to consumers, and to connect farmers. Um, farming, um, the egg, uh, commodities change, uh, could likely see more smart farming with new technologies like drone, AI, um, uh, blockchain, big data. Uh, and this has shown, uh, this, this pandemic has shown that uh, there is imperative to speed that up. In India, especially, for example, um, there's, a, there's, there's a new urgency to find ways to reach farmers uh, for communications. E commerce, while well, we're all familiar, while well, we shop at home, uh, e commerce in the upstream, uh, uh, um, linking egg inputs to farmers, could also be accelerated. Um, Asia has a very long and fragmented food and agri supply chain and distribution. The virus outbreak would have disrupted and maybe closed many of the small businesses down, constrict the supply chain and lay off many of the labor intensive industries and distribution chain channels. Just look at India with its lockdown. This could well be a time for industry consolidation where the big companies are likely to increase its market share, uh, increase its presence and integration across the value chain and enlarge the ecosystems. For example, animal protein companies uh, will try to build breeding system and will even set up an integrated supply chain. Um, in India, the unorganized market channel is severely impacted with agents, intermediaries, um, uh, disappearing because there's just not a lot to work. Um, and so, the, but the organized channel but actually uh, uh, penetrate and expand faster. Now, I mentioned before the food and agri sector, and this is not just in Asia, but also found across in Europe and the US, has shown that especially the production of farming is still highly dependent on labor, including migrant workers, unregistered, illegal and this is a time when companies are starting to think about this automation and labor reliance in the longer run even including in the plantation and farms that we have seen here across asia uh, however in the short term labor costs will be low due to each, this, this uh, huge unemployment many plants which are labor intensive in this and during this time, we'll be reviewing these operations on robotics, for example. In India, we have heard that agrochemical plants, which are less automated with high requirement of labor, has gotten into some mis mishaps. Because of the lack of labor, they weren't able to operate these plants uh, uh, properly. Uh, for plants, for factories, they are beginning to also have to think about biosecurity for both the products and for workers. We talk so much about supply chain disruptions, and supply chain is top of mind for many, many companies executives. And the risk related to supply chain disruption will be reevaluated, especially among those choking points in uh, international trade routes. Uh, there will be a call for. for or incentive and urgency to, especially for the bigger companies to uh, invest overseas for better uh, uh, securing of sourcing. Uh, there will be increased uh, need for storage if um, um, both at source as well as importing. Both China and Southeast Asia are net importer of grains and oil seeds. And, and it shows this COVID 19 has shows that both region is limited to uh, is exposed to limited availabilities of raw materials due to these uh, disruptions. Inventory control operations management has also been um, top of mind. Like I mentioned before, we operate in a just in time efficiency manner. I don't think it will go, go all the way to just in case where there's huge stocking level, but there will be a form of just in time plus. And there are companies will be reviewing to build resiliencies 
uh, not just in efficiencies, inventory across the supply chain. Increased storage in warehouses would, would likely be one of the uh, changes coming. We'll talk about national policies. Um, many countries are beginning to think about increasing and emphasizing its uh, food security and sufficiency uh, uh, agenda. Um, some companies are uh, so, sorry. Some countries would might think about improving output and yield across its whole value chain, but also about overseas sourcing and supply. But as we have seen, this runs against anti-globalization trend that we are seeing right now. Last, I want to talk just about consumers. Um, sorry, before I talk about consumers, I'll talk about R&D and product innovation. There's now imperative, again, to increase this uh, in terms of from all the way from ag inputs all the way down to consumer uh, products. There'll be more diagnostic uh, testing um, procedures and and there'll be more vaccine, animal health, um, R&D, um, uh, nutrition levels that uh, the two scientists have highlighted, um, and more investment into in-house genetics and flexible feed reformulations, etc. And lastly, consumers. There'll be we think that there will be substantial changes in consumer behaviors. Eating at home will be a new norm. Uh, the worry about financial security will be reflected in food spending. Health, wellness, immunity building, part of that. Um, we've highlighted, uh, everyone has highlighted uh, acceleration in digital, e-commerce, uh, cashless payment. And all this, uh, will actually have an impact all the way up the supply chain to farming. And this is where farmers have to realize how consumer uh, behavior and demand will change for uh, their products. There's even a need for consumer education and awareness. In India, in the beginning of the virus outbreak, um, there's been social media rumors and, and, and fake news about how the uh, uh, virus was spread uh, via poultry. And that led to a crash of more than half of poultry prices. It's proven to be unfounded, but it took a long time for the poultry industry to get back uh, to its feet right now. So just to very quickly conclude on the industry changes, there have been many reports about the agri-food supply chain during this uh, pandemic. But our view is it is actually not broken. It is stretched, it is imbalanced, mainly because of disruptions and incoming economic dislocations and the transitions and eventual post-COVID world. But it shows that we cannot take our agri-food supply chain for granted. Next slide, please. We think that in the longer term, what will drive agri-food chain across Asia uh, is what we've uh, highlighted in our uh, report with Thomas and PWC last year. This is called Asia Food Challenge, which still can be accessed at www.asiafoodchallenge.com. This report highlights that Asia falls short on producing enough food with current practices and technology. Resources like arable land and water are being depleted and uh, environmental damages sustained, and consumer demand for nutritious, safer, and more food will increase for urbanization and population and income growth. And there's also a lot of waste along the long fragmented supply chain. And what is needed is investment and innovation across the whole value chain of Asia. Um, we think uh, I'll just highlight two key areas, especially post-COVID, that um, innovation and investments are truly need, needed. One of this is, and, and both actually resonate very uh, similarly with uh, Professor Tang and Professor Fang. One is starting with the farmers. Asia has an estimated 400 million small farmers. And I, I agree totally with uh, uh, the two professors 
the poor, the farmers, the smallholders will be impacted more uh, by this COVID. And so innovation and investment has to be uh, looked at to address their needs as, as well as overcome their constraints. The innovation has to be precise as it's applicable. Phone apps can be easily uh, used, for example. But, um, but given Asia's or smallholder situation, Asia's food supply can be transformed when farmers adopt innovations because of the ability to weigh risk and returns, not by lack of funds. Another key area that we think we should, uh, I'd like to especially highlight is feeding the cities across Asia. The pandemic has clearly highlighted that when population are concentration, producing enough and supplying to the urban cities will have to be rethinked. Uh, localization or shorting supply chain have always been mentioned, but it could be put in the front row now. So in conclusion, uh, I agree with uh, both our professors. Asia needs innovation and technology to transform its agri-food system into one that's ecologically and economically sustainable. But Asia needs a collective effort. So I'll end it with this. Thanks. Thank you, Ping, and uh, a very enlightening uh, private sector and uh, economic perspective on the trends on what the industry as well as the consumer will be looking at and what are the change in the value chains uh, in the coming years with innovation as well as investment that are needed. So thank you for all our three eminent speakers who really share the key um, knowledge as well as your perspectives with regards to the topics that we have today and uh, we did have do have we did receive and also are receiving many questions so i would like to call upon um for the next uh, session the panel discussion um mr jeff smith uh the president of uc southeast asia who is hosting our host uh, for this uh seminar series to uh be the moderator and uh, of course, to facilitate the discussion that are, um, we see that uh, will take up about 20 minutes. Thank you. Jeff, over to you. Okay. Jeff, please unmute yourself. Is that work better? Okay, there we go. Good evening, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon to some of you. Um, it's a brave new world um, that we're into. It's um, a lot of uncharted territory. It's a pity that we can't meet the speakers uh, face to face, but uh, due to the advantages of new technologies, we can connect all around the world. So we have participants from Africa, from South America, from the US, Sri Lanka, all over Asia. Uh, so we're covering a large part of the world. We've been very lucky to hear from three distinguished speakers. Um, and uh, now we're gonna get a chance to talk and, and, and ask some of the questions. So I'm going to, uh, to dive right into that. Um, the um, first question I wanna ask is, um, the one of the presentations showed not much progress in sustainable agriculture. Um, and uh, the question I want to raise is about how to encourage that and also metrics. Um, I know that uh, IFPRI has worked with uh, Johns Hopkins and is in the process of developing a sustainable food systems dashboard so you can sort of see where we are. How can we measure uh, movement towards sustainability and encourage progress in that area? Uh, maybe Professor Fan would like to start. Uh, Sure, yes, I would be very happy to do that. You hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. Yes, I think this is a very important question, uh, sustainability. My sort of take is we failed in policy. We do have technologies, we do have good practices, but we do not have good policy. So the current policy is to provide subsidies for farmers to produce more, more grains. So for example, the whole world right now uh, is providing more than $600 billion to subsidize water, fertilizers, pesticides, 
uh, and so on, to produce basically probably three or four major crops, rice, wheat, and maize, and so on. So as a result of that, the farmers will overuse fertilizers, overuse water, degrade land, and so on. So I think we must fix policies. Can we reform these policies, use this money to innovate? I think uh, speakers, um, including Ho Ten and uh, Pincho, about innovations, but we don't have the money. Where do we get the money? The subsidies, $600 billion. Can we reform them to use this money to innovate in new technologies, uh, including conservation agriculture, sustainable agriculture technologies? And here I also wanted to emphasize nutrition. So can we use some of this money to pursue nutrition value chains, value chain for nutrition, food system for nutrition, to make sure that everybody has access to nutritious and healthy foods. Right now, the prices of healthy foods, nutrition foods, are very expensive. So let's tackle this big giant uh, in our field, subsidy. Going back to you, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, Cheng, you maybe some additional comments on that. I, I think you are still on mute, Professor Cheng. Prof, can you unmute yourself? Fine. Okay, now we hear you. Okay, I, I want to build on what, what uh, Dr. Fan said. I think it's important that we have incentives at both ends of the supply chain, basically the producers and the consumers. Yeah, I think, you know, if I were a producer, I would want to know why should I go for sustainable practices? What's the incentive to me to do so? Right? So there's a, an analogous to say good agricultural practice. You could have good sustainable practice and, ass and assure that, you know, the producers are rewarded in some way. At the consumer end, we're hearing in Singapore now, you know, there are consumers asking for sustainably produced food, okay, which then feeds back to the producer. So some of we've also got to link these two together to come up with truly sustainable systems as a whole. Okay. So that would be my kind of uh, addition to the, what the Prof. Fan has said. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a very good point. So, so that leads to the, the next question of this. There's been a lot of discussion about linking nutrition and agriculture. Um, obviously, uh, all of our nutrients come from food uh, produced in the food supply chain, um, but the linkages are sometimes not very, um, not, not very well understood or very sh much strengthened. Um, I sometimes say farmers don't get paid for nutrition. Um, how, what steps could be taken to strengthen those links between between the agricultural livestock uh, food supply chain and and uh, nutrition? Well, I can start. Yeah, it's okay. I can start. Yeah, actually, I wrote a book before and after April on linking agriculture to nutrition. Uh, so here we emphasize a couple of things. One is uh, obviously the, uh, the right now the technology innovations are very much on stable crops. Can we do more with fruits, vegetables, beans? Uh, I think the technology, the value chains, all have to uh, that's to use the nutrition as a goal. That's number one. Uh, number two is uh, the policy again. The policy like the Ministry of Agriculture, their objective is Self-sufficiency, food self-sufficiency, doesn't matter what food. I think the Ministry of Agriculture should really change their goal to providing healthy, nutritious foods for everybody in the country. It does not matter whether that food is coming from other countries or uh, from their own countries uh, and, and beyond. So the uh, governance is also very critical. Now, some of the technologies, the biofortification, the uh, so the, you can actually add micronutrients into crops through breeding, even traditional breeding, you can do that. Uh, so there are many ways to link agriculture to nutrition material. Oh, I find the woman. Woman, obviously, woman has to be in power in the whole value chain. The women do pay attention to nutrition. The children are stunted, the family do not have access to healthy and nutritious diets. Women are very much worried. So let's empower them. Let's make sure that they have the means to pursue that goal. Over. 
Okay, those are all those are all extremely important points. The EM, uh, just just to mention um, this this whole issue of the nutrients in the food. So uh, ILSI has done quite a bit of work, and 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 obviously FAO does tremendous work in uh, developing databases on the nutrient contents in food. This is for some people kind of a boring topic, but it's uh, if you're trying to link nutrition and and agriculture, good to know the nutrients in in the food that we're actually eating. Jeff, may I, may I just say something? Yes, please. Oh, sorry. Yes, please. Uh, Professor Tang, please. After you, after you, Ping. No, I actually wanted to address the investment and innovation question before that, but, uh, and, 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 and thank, thanks for this. So the main thing I wanted to say is that um, the investment, yes, governments can, can invest and will have to invest, but I think the industry still have to play a very big part in investment and in, in innovation. And I'll just share that uh, uh, food and agriculture investment actually, um, first of all, lacks many other industries. Uh, that this is a phenomenon for the whole world. But of course, in Asia, it even lacks those that are found in the US and, and Europe and many other places. And that is because, and I think everyone understand how, why that is so, especially across uh, Asia. And so if, first of all, if, if the governments, first of all, can address some of the issues uh, and that will facilitate uh, private sector investment that will help. And some of these includes, uh, and, and, and this is what uh, I think uh, Professor Tan maybe have highlighted, the fragmentation of land holding uh, across in Asia. It doesn't bring about mechanization, it bring, doesn't bring about even Uberization uh, easily. Uh, that, that is something, you know, how, how, how to enable uh, uh, land holdings to be to be uh, even if it's not consolidated to be used for, for, for credit that could be something that is very valuable um, and Professor Tang has mentioned about uh, ASEAN and its regulatory and, um, uh, and policies uh, across the many countries one of the things that many uh, executives in across the private sectors have found that there are still um, not totally aligned regulatory frameworks across many of the countries. And that prevents uh, an investment into scale, for example. So mm -hmm. um, uh, fixing the regulatory frameworks across would be very helpful. And investment in core infrastructure. If you don't even have roads to certain places, you can't build warehouse, you can't build all storage. So infrastructure remains a very core element for um, for, for, for these investments to, to, to take place. So these are just, just some of the things that uh, company executives have highlighted. And I think that the private sectors can still play a large part uh, and, and they have to work hand in hand with the government, uh, setting up uh, innovation hubs, which Singapore is, is actually in the forefront of doing so uh, in, in, in the past in, in high tech and now in food. Uh, those are things that can help uh, build um, uh, a critical mix for innovation. Um, uh, and, and even things like um, uh, uh, streamlining financial incentives, especially for startup. We're talking about startups now, especially. And innovation really comes from a startup. And first and foremost, that we've seen in the US and Europe. If, if governments across can facilitate that, the hubs, financial incentives for these startups that can uh, take place across Asia. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chu. Uh, Professor Chang, you wanted to uh, add one? Yes, I wanted, I wanted to, to say something about your question about agriculture and nutrition. I think what COVID-19 has shown us too is that it's not agriculture per se, and especially in the urban environments, it's actually gardening, gardening and nutrition. I was so heartened to read this morning that in the UK, you know, there are more and more people taking hold of their own, you know, kind of uh, nutrition security by growing more vegetables in the backyard. Now, certainly in the place like Singapore, you know, we have seen a uh, re-emergence re of interest in people growing their own vegetables, yeah, but not to the extent of, of course of the UK and other countries. So I think that, that that's an important element and that then goes uh, in the urban farming. What can we do? And the majority of us live in cities now. What can we do as citizens of cities? 
to take control of our own nutrition by growing our own vegetables in small gardens of some kind. I would put it to us all that, you know, that's where self-empowerment is so important, I think, you know, to allow people to, to do these kind of things, and we should provide the means to do so. Okay, like, like I know some countries are not running out of seeds because there's been a big surge of people buying vegetable seeds to grow vegetables themselves. I wanted to add that element, not just agriculture alone, but, you know, kind of to me, it's gardening and this kind of agriculture in a subsector, really. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you for the thing. So, uh, yes, I, you all have touched on uh, really uh, incredible points. Um, this uh, rural-urban uh, divide and and how to uh, how to link that because um, uh, certainly populations around the world are becoming more urban, um, but most of the food is grown in in the rural areas. Although we may have some possibilities for urban farming and 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 home farming. Um, I think this whole uh, point about inclusiveness and in bringing everybody to um, uh, to be able to participate in the global uh, economic improvement. Um, we've seen very dramatic uh, reductions over the past two decades in global poverty, in infant mortality. Um, these are very important trends and the question is how to keep those going and eventually eliminate those problems perhaps except in, in conflict areas. Um, and what policies we can take to to do that um, in in Asia, but also other parts of the world where audience listening in Africa and uh, and uh, South America, there's still a lot of stakeholder farming. So my my you know, long time ago, my mom was raised on a farm in in Oklahoma and California. Um, but nowadays, uh, if I want to take my daughter to a farm, it's more like going to Disneyland uh, to, to to visit. Um, there's a people don't get that link to farming. Um, and many of the people who are vulnerable are small stakeholder farms who are growing either for their own family's uh, food consumption or uh, if they're growing fruits and they can't get them to market, uh, they, they, they also suffer. Um, and then we have all this talk about, about innovation and, and investment, but it's not easy for these small stakeholder farmers to, uh, to do that. How, how could that be addressed in, in a way to bring that all together and improve the strength of those downward trends in mortality and and uh, poverty and improve nutrition. Uh, you're all, all free to start. Uh, <laughs> Professor, can, can continue a bit? I don't know, let Shengen go first. I think he's worked in this area. <laughs> well, I think the... Um, Institutional change is will be very critical here to make sure that smallholders have access to land. Now, the, yes, I mentioned that the farmland is very fragmented, particularly in Southeast Asia, as Paul has mentioned. Uh, so how can we make sure that smallholders either move up or move out? That's the, some of the language I used before. So if there's opportunity for smallholders to move to cities, why not? Now, I was a smallholder farmer in back in in my village 45 years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't to move out. Then the people left there, they can increase the size, they can move up by accessing mm -hmm. to good technologies, good market, through uh, all these value chains. So the, the people left in my village is now you know, quite doing pretty well because uh, the consolidation of land, access to market, access to credit, so moving up, moving out schools will be the solution. Over. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, the, the technology. So you mentioned earlier cashless payments. Um, of course, in China, uh, WeChat and some other uh, cashless payments are popular. Uh, even in Africa, in Pesa, in Kenya is uh, very popular and even rural areas can get this information, which has an, uh, an impact, a positive impact on information flows as well, besides payments. Um, I, I think a number of you have shown, actually, although this is a real crisis that we're dealing with, the, the resilience of the food supply system, the food supply chain has been rather rather good considering all the, all, all the difficulties. Um, and maybe this information flows can help uh, with that. Um, obviously, the closer that you can link demand and supply um, with better information means lower stocks uh, and, and more efficient production perhaps. At, at the same time, uh, there is some thought of food banks um, 
I, I'm not, I don't know if you have a comment on the extent to which food banks played a role in the current crisis and ought to play a role in future crises. Um, maybe those two points. No. Well, on the food, you mentioned about the food banks. So now I just have become a new board member of the global network of food banks. I learned quite a bit. Now, food bank studies in US, in Europe, they are highly important in feeding people during crisis here in Asia, including Southeast Asia, China. The food bank food banks uh, idea is still very new. We must do more on that. So, um, for example, certain farmers or certain processors couldn't sell their products. They could, do, they could actually donate them to food banks. And as the food banks can help to distribute foods to its urban poor uh, and some of the rural poor. So I do think the, the, the food banks can play a very big role in our region. So let's, let's work more on that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Professor Teng? Yeah. I was going just to, 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 to affirm what I think Shangden has said, really. I think certainly even in, in a country as rich in Singapore, there are quite a few kind of, uh, I would say, active food banks. Okay, because we still have people who are who don't have economic access to food. They just can't afford food for different reasons, you know. And many of the the, the, the phenomena we've heard from paying in yourself, of our people losing their jobs, not able to afford food and so on, daily wage workers I mean, in different countries. Yeah, I think food banks are the only solution at the moment in the short term to help these people. And it's not just in Asia. You know, look at pictures, you know, on TV over the US, you know, middle class families queuing up for food. It's it's a worldwide phenomenon really, I think. But I want to get back to an earlier point for this discussion, you know, this thing about small older farmers. I think it's not just information or technology alone. Okay, there's a whole set of enablers that have to come together, right? Starting with policy, you know, regulations, infrastructure and so on. But we, we mustn't kind of lose sight of what we're trying to do for these smallholder farmers. Accepting that in Asia, as Peng has said, you know, there's millions of them, and they're still one of the main sources of food okay, for us in Asia. So, so I like what one what one uh, one particular company has coined the term of, you know, getting smallholder farmers to move from subsistence to progressive to become enterprise farmers. Yeah, I think that's key. You know, becoming enterprise farmers where they create their own livelihoods where they are value-adding activities. And this that addresses the other issue of the, you know, the rural the urban drift. You know, if you can incentivize people to go back to the countryside, yeah, and in fact have a livelihood, you know, then the, the, uh, the net result is that you're going to get more food produced and more people remaining in the countryside. But that, of course, it is a simplistic picture. There are all kinds of issues involved here. <laughs> it's profound knows so well. I just wanted to add that, that, that part there. Yeah, okay. It's key for us to get the most small the farmers, yeah. Okay, okay thank you. That, I would like yeah. to hear from Mr. Chu uh, on, on those topics and, and also the investment. So not only do we have a lot of uh, smallholder uh, farmers in Asia and other parts of the world, but also a lot of the food processing are done by SMEs. Um, so we think of some of the big companies, but uh, SMEs play a key role as well. Um, so how can that be, uh, again, linked to this uh, overall uh, security and sustainability. Let me address the food banks and, and the small farmers. I totally agree. Food banks and all these support measures are definitely needed now in the, in the short term um, because they are really affected the poor, the farmers, um, uh, the, the rural sector. But I rather, I mean, I'm someone who, who believes that you don't give a fish, you, you teach someone to fish. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that, that needs to be thought of more robustly, in the, uh, especially for these small farmers. So I totally agree that uh, moving from subsistence to enterprise, I think that's a great, great phrase uh, to use. That really should be the way we look at how to enable the small, small holders. Um, and that we actually have seen many uh, advances and innovations being tested up. Uh, for example, in India, in, uh, in Indochina, where small ag tech companies are helping to uh, serve uh, the farmers. Uh, farmers across the world face all kinds of issues, but the number one issue is weather. 
the number one issue is water, number one issue is soil, number one issue is price and what to, what to produce. So I, I know we might not um, emphasize this enough, but information, I think, is one key issue that farmers, smallholder farmers, have to deal with. If you give them enough tools, far, farmers are one of the hardiest people in the world. You give them enough tools, you give them enough information, you, give them, you help them along the way, they will survive. And they will survive if you um, provide that information, not just of the prices they have to sell with, the prices that the market is consuming, the, pro the information that what the consumers need. That will help them um, farm the correct thing. Um, um, I, I mentioned before, and Professor Peng also has mentioned that there needs to be many parts that comes together. Uh, and I think this part uh, for this, the governments and companies can come together, uh, mm -hmm. provide some of this. The whole infrastructure, the whole ecosystem, like you say, including the farmers in an inclusive uh, model, that has to happen because we are not going to get away from this um, land holding and fragmented farms for a very long time. That is just a legacy and that's how Asia will remain for a long time. And so how do you fix this in the meantime, mm. uh, un unless you know, bigger farms can be, can, can be fall? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's, that's very key. Okay, on thank you. SME, yeah, and, uh, on the question of SME in, in industry structures, well, there's, there's two sides of a, of a coin here. SME has, and the, and the emergence in the path of SME, the presence of SME actually has provided Asia with a very strong private sector uh, uh, backbone. Unfortunately, this COVID, especially in the food and in many of the hospitality, or for example, sectors, will see a drastic reduction and disruption of SME in the streets. And mm -hmm. what's going to come out of it, nobody's too sure yet. In, in many other countries, and this, is, this has to do with economics and the, the legal system, economic systems are vibrant when SME will fall, SME will come back again. And that allows a rejuvenation in, uh, of the whole economic system. We, we have to see whether in Asia, post-COVID, SMEs can come back, and that, that, that will show how resilient uh, Asia is. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Those are, those are all really, really mm -hmm. good. So I, I think it's clear that this um, COVID-19 crisis has, has, has just highlighted some of the ongoing issues that we have to deal with in the food supply chain. What is the optimal diet? Um, how do we feed uh, nine or ten billion people? Um, climate, uh, all of, all of those issues. So this is highlighted. Um, we're coming to the end, so we have to close. We have a lot more questions we could deal with. On it was mentioned water. So agriculture is usually the biggest user of water, and how that can be improved. Um, food safety and the impacts on the supply chain, traceability, food fraud, many more questions. We could go on for another hour, but unfortunately we come to an end. So I would like to give each of the three of you just uh, two minutes to, to wrap up with a couple of final comments, um, maybe starting uh, Ping Chou with you. Okay, so um, if I can conclude, I think there are short-term challenges and issues that we have to deal with and they are uh, longer term concerning the food and agri uh, sector, especially across the nation. I would say that in the short term, I think we need to convince governments across the world uh, to not, to abstain from nationalism. I think globalization and trade and, um, uh, needs to go on. Uh, because that's going to hurt everyone uh, if you just put in export bans, etc. I've, I've mentioned before, there's enough food. It's just the supply chain is disrupted. We need to think of how to solve the supply chain and not just, um, it's, it's game theory. Once somebody starts doing something, it will affect everyone. So for me, uh, trade issues and export bans, you need to address uh, and, and avoid it. 
another immediate issue is the safety measures, biosecurity measures. And, and we have seen that um, as, as, as a medical professions, as governments still continue to deal with virus, um, one thing that everyone from companies to governments to individuals have to put in place now is safety measures with regards to virus. Because if you don't do that, um, you know, the food chain will break down again. And the food chain will run from the farming to the processing to the supply chain, consumer, mm -hmm. uh, a demand for, for, for food. So safety measures, um, um, uh, it has to be a short-term um, immediate uh, concern. In the longer term, um, I would still like to urge everyone to look at longer term climate change sustainability issues. These continue to be first and foremost, and that's going to impact Asia and Africa more than anywhere. And, and, and the longer term food issues will still come from climate change and sustainability. And this also includes uh, water. And we've mentioned this many times, smallholder farmers across the nation has to be something that uh, we look at as well as feeding the cities. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Yes, in, in Singapore, although we are increasing a bit of our own food production, we definitely depend on, on trade and, uh, and, and our neighbors. So, uh, Professor Fun. Yes. Um, and uh, have very big work to do. In 2007, 2008, food price crisis. Uh, many countries in our region use export banks, particularly rice export banks. Rice price increased by 100%, 200% within six months. And we learned to feed the After that, also in class three, set up a, a regional rice reserve. That really helped the region to calm down the rice price. I think this crisis, we can do more too. So mm -hmm. the class in class three and then maybe even class six, the uh, mm -hmm. we are in a recovery stage, right? We, we have already um, over the peak of the uh, infection. So we are recovering. Mm -hmm. We need to work together. The trade, yeah. the, you know, the regional value chains, make sure that the vegetables, I know vegetables have been traded Fruits have been traded within the region. Mm. Let's make sure that no country will use COVID-19 as an excuse, as, as an excuse to set up trade restrictions, whether it's import or export. I think we can do it. Our region can set a very good example. Mm. Not just mm. us in plus three. I think us in plus six. Mm -hmm. Over. Mm. Good. <laughs> good. Okay. Okay. Thank you, and Thank Professor you. Tang. Okay, uh, let me just make three points in conclusion. I think first is, I think the crisis has taught us that we've got to put the agri-food sector back on the table okay, for, for investments in different areas, for discussion, priority by governments. Okay, I think too many governments have tended to, you know, in a sense, sideline agriculture, you know, in players of other sectors. Huh? So that's one point. Second point is I think we could, we could have somehow increase the resilience in our food systems through multi-pronged approaches. And this includes not, not just supply chain self-production, but also tapping into previously untapped sources of production. And, and coming from Singapore, I would say like urban, very urban areas is one example, okay? Which is emerging as an important source of food to complement production in the countryside. The last point I want to make is that I think we need to be more prepared. This whole area of preparedness for food security, just like the way the health people do, okay? There's a whole area of health security preparedness. We haven't seen too much of food security preparedness as a concept being implemented. I, I think Prof. Fun just gave one example. One of the preparedness elements is to have stockpiles in reserve at a regional level. The other is infrastructure. Okay, there's also policies, regional collaboration. So these are all going towards this concept of food security preparedness, which I don't believe we've looked at seriously. Over, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for all uh, this uh, uh, very excellent insights and the technical analysis, uh, really important. I hope our viewers have appreciated that. Um, we are, uh, again, we have lots of questions. We'll have to think about if we, uh, if we write this up. Uh,
formally all the good information. We are going to make the video available. Um, other questions like uh, what is the, what are the priorities for the research agenda, but I think we've given lots of food for thought and lots of uh, information. So I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Ms. Zhang to, uh, to uh, wrap up the webinar. Thank you all again. Thank you, Jeff, Prof. Fan, Prof. Tang, and Mr. Chu for a very impactful panel session that could easily go on for another hour. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of this webinar. I'd like to thank all our web speakers for their excellent presentations and to Jeff Smith, who guided the development and moderated the panel session, covering the many important issues and questions raised for the discussion. And of course, on how we could better integrate agricultural, technology, and nutrition. We will follow up on some of the deliberation on part two of this webinar on food system resilience and help identify appropriate actions and collaboration where you see can contribute. You may find out more on the extensive activities and publication of UC and UC entities across the world through our website. We thank and acknowledge our panel of experts who have declared no conflict of interest in attending and presenting in this webinar. In closing, I would also like to thank UC Global, UC Southeast Asia Region, and UC Asia Entity staff and colleagues who supported and collaborated on this webinar series. And to all participants who attended and sent in your questions, we appreciate your feedback and welcome you to join our next event on Tuesday, June 16, on Science Frontiers and Public Health, addressing the biomedical sciences, technology and nutrition issues of related interest to COVID-19. The part two of the Food System Resilience Webinar will be held in early July. So see you again. Goodbye and have a good day. <music>